Shalom family, a special Shalom and Passover. We have a double holy holiday. I hope everybody is enjoying it and having your lamb, your bitter herb, and unleavened bread. What a beautiful holiday. Okay. I had someone write, why does he call himself Brother L? Because, you know, they thought this was wrong. Well, you know, I I've spoken to Brother L a couple of times by phone. And, you you know, many of you that have been with me for a while know that I had him on my channel about a total of three times. And the reason why he is Brother L is because his first name is Larry. That's what his name is. So he just goes by, you know, the, the first initial of his name and he just makes it L, but that's why. His Gentile name is Larry. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started again. If you're just coming in, um, happy holy holiday. It's a double holiday because it's a celebration of Sabbath and Passover for many of our brothers and sisters across the world. And I'm hoping you're having a great one. Okay, y'all. Let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. Please give me a one if you can see my screen. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. All right. Let's see. All esteem to the Most High Elohim. This is our brother L. Let's start at the book of John, chapter 1, verse 45 and 46. Before I go there, I want to deal with a mentality that has been given to us by our enemies, by our oppressors, and by those that hate us. Before I talk about what that mentality is, I want you to think about whenever you meet brothers and sisters, whenever you meet our people, especially some of our people that may still be in the world a little bit, what's usually the first thing that you get asked by your people? Usually the first thing when somebody first seeing you, first meeting you, the thing that they ask you is, where you from? Where you from? Think about this and tell me I'm not telling the truth. The first thing after you meet our people that 98% of them will ask you is where you from? If y'all from the same state, what city you from? If y'all from the same city, what neighborhood you from? That's automatic that we ask each other that, right? I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's right. I just want to get to a mentality that we have had, especially here on this side, being raised in America, those of us from America, and many other spots all over the world, too. This takes place as well. So people are ask you where you're from. They'll ask you what neighborhood you're from, right? For some reason, that's real... <laughs> That's really important for our people to know when they first meet you. Yo, where you from? What city you from? What neighborhood you from, right? Now, let's go back to how our people were in ancient times. Whenever you came across one of your brothers or sisters, the first thing that they would ask you, and this is recorded in scripture, there's many examples, they would ask you, what tribe? Who's your father's tribe? Who is your father's family? That's what they would ask you. So it wouldn't be what neighborhood you from, what city you from. It'll be who's your tribe? Who's the tribe of your fathers? What tribe you from? You see the difference in mentality? Those of us that have been raised in this generation with this enemy, with this oppressor, We've developed a mindset of a neighborhood mentality. Listen to this very carefully. 
We have developed a neighborhood mentality, something that the enemy and the oppressor has called the ghetto or the hood, right? You all know that saying that folk love to say all the time, you can take the Negro out of the hood, but you can't take the hood out the Negro. Now, where does that come from? Does that come from the Most High? Does that come from the Messiah? Does that come from our ancestors? Or does that come from the oppressor putting that type of mentality on us? Because remember what I just got done saying. In ancient times, they would say, who is your father's tribe? What tribe you from? It wouldn't be what hood you from? Where you from? Who's your father and who's your tribe? So how we identified ourselves and the mentality of what we saw ourselves as was totally different then than it is now. Let me ask y'all this. Do y'all think it'll be any ghettos in New Jerusalem? Yes or no? And when I say ghettos, here's what I mean. Whenever we live in an area that we don't own the real estate in, we can't say that that's our neighborhood. No matter how much we get it tattooed on us, no matter how much we scream, this my block, this my neighborhood, guess what? If the Koreans, the Asians, the Arabs, and all them own the real estate there, then guess what? It's not our neighborhood. We may have been born there, lived there all our life, but if we don't own no land there, we can't really say it's ours. We can't really say we own it or possess it or claim it like that. Follow me on this for a moment. Because we got to take everything back to scripture. The way our people did it was there was inheritances of land that was given according to the tribes. It's talked about this in the laws and commands of Torah, how Joshua and Moses broke it down to where which tribes settled where and certain lands was allotted to certain tribes. So we knew our inheritance and our possession. But on this side, we've been put in areas that they have called ghettos, hoods. And I'm not saying everybody. A lot of people can relate to that, though, where we've been in these areas and we claim these areas as our own, even if we don't own real estate and land there. And I'm going to show you the mind trick of the oppressor that the ghetto mentality, the quote unquote hood mentality, they've always associated it with something negative. Because what do you think immediately when somebody says ghetto or hood? I'm going to tell you what I think and what I've seen. Whole bunch of churches, whole bunch of liquor stores, whole bunch of chicken spots. You know, the chicken spots where you can go up in the gas station, you can get the chicken, you can get beer up in there, you can get your gas pump, you can get the flaming Hot Cheetos, all that. All, all up in the same spot. And it's usually an Arab or an Indian or an Asian that's owning the spot. Whenever you think of ghetto, hood, what immediately comes to your mind? Do a whole bunch of tore up streets come to your mind? Does a whole bunch of property with a whole bunch of stuff written all over it come to your mind? Let me ask you this. Does anything positive come to your mind whenever ghetto, hood is spoken to you? Because all over the internet, usually anything that they put ghetto or hood on is some chicks having a fight, is some dudes out there fighting, is some ratchetness going on. Usually it ain't no righteousness going on, it's usually ratchetness going on. Anytime they put up a video, anything with ghetto or hood in it, and I'm going to show you how this is all the oppressor. Because remember, when we were in our land, what was it? tribes, your father's clan, your father's name was attached to your identity. Here's something interesting to know. And I'm going to show you how powerful the Elohim of Israel is and how powerful we as a people are. Because guess what? Even with all that the enemy has done and continues to do, we continue to be a powerful people. 
Now, listen very carefully to this. Since we're on the topic of hood, right? Let's go to John chapter 1, verse 45 through 46. Let's see what it has to say about where the Messiah came from. Now, listen. It says, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Yeshua of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now, the area that the Messiah was raised in was an area that was notorious amongst those times. Notorious. Nazareth was notorious. We could say that in these present times, Nazareth would have been looked at as a ghetto, a hood, a slum, where the Messiah came from. Now, just pause and reflect on that for a moment, that the king of the universe, the Messiah, was raised in the ghetto. Now, I'm not saying that so that we can have the mentality of being proud of poverty, being proud of dilapidated conditions, being proud of areas where there's a lot of fatherlessness, being proud of areas where there's high abortion rates, being proud of areas where there's so much sickness and death and demonic activity and trauma that destroys the mind. I'm not saying we should take pride in that. What I am saying is that the Messiah, just like many of our people, was like a rose that grew from the crack in concrete. Like many of our brothers and Syria, brothers and sisters who come from the worst of the areas and still rise as shining beacons of light and hope to our people. But let me tell you, ghetto hood has never been the norm for our people. This is what I want us to understand. Even though we as a people have always been able to rise up out of those conditions, that's not supposed to be our norm. A whole bunch of uh, broke down churches teaching lies, a whole bunch of winos and, uh, and, 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 and crackheads roaming through the street that's not supposed to be our norm. A whole bunch of these uh, ran down restaurants where they serving food that's killing us, that's not supposed to be our norm. But whenever you look at how they put things out there about our culture, especially in the Western world, in the Americas, and in many cases in the UK, you would think that ghetto hood is our norm. You would think that... Uh, Baby mamas with no fathers in the home is our norm. You would think that us having diseases or high blood pressure from all the fried foods and all that is our norm. You would think that folk, especially young brothers dying at 1819, getting shot up by each other and by the police, you would think that's our norm. Because in this society, they praise hood. They praise ghetto. It's, it's exalted, right? And guess what? Many of us are just representing where we came from, just being who we are. That's it. You ain't got to put on no front or no fake for nobody. You from where you from and you are who you are. But I'm going to show you how the enemy wants us to think that ghetto, hood, impoverished, low life, uh, death culture. He wants us to think that that is our norm. It goes back to the question that I asked before. Do you think it's any ghettos in New Jerusalem. Do you think that? Really take your time to think about this. The Messiah, the Most High, the Messiah said, in my father's house are many mansions. Does that sound like a ghetto? Does that sound like a rat infested, piss infested, welfare infested hood to you? Does New Jerusalem, a city with streets of gold, 12 gates made of all sorts of pearl with the names of the prophets, not no rest in peace shout outs, not rest in peace whoever written on the walls and the halls, but the names of the apostles and disciples are written on the gates. The names of the 12 tribes of Israel are written on the gates and it ain't going to be no graffiti. It's going to be the highest, most beautiful form of architecture you've ever seen. Does that sound like a ghetto or a hood? that they've led you to believe is our 
default conditions that we have to live in. Does that sound like that to you? Think about this for a moment. And what does all the brothers and sisters who make it out, what do they want to do? One or two things. They want to build the neighborhood back up and go and give back. Or they want to make sure that their children never have to grow up in those conditions. Tell me I'm lying. All those who have come from those conditions, they don't want their children to have to go through that. And a certain portion of them want to go back and give back to the community to see the community built back up. But you know what takes place? A lot of our people fall victim to the ghetto hood default mentality that the oppressor has put up upon them. So you know what takes place? Even in the situation where brothers like Nipsey Hussle who want to go back and build up the community, you got a Negro from that community that will kill them like they did Nipsey in front of his store. And this brother's trying to go back to build that community back up only to get killed by somebody in the community. And you know what takes place? That makes a lot of these coons and people who turn their back on their people say, see, that's why you can't do nothing for them niggas. Every time you try to get out, they try to pull you back in. So that's what makes them have the mentality and not even, not even wanting to be around our people. But guess what, though? We can't have that mentality. What we do have to do is be more ownership of land minded and be more mega community minded. You see? Look at what the Gentiles are doing. We're going in and gentrifying a lot of these neighborhoods. The same areas that brothers had tatted on their chest, whatever neighborhood they from, whether it's Detroit, whether it's Baltimore, whether it's Houston, wherever they from, a lot of these same neighborhoods that so many brothers died with it tatted on their chest, now it's overrun by Gentiles walking golden terriers and going to Starbucks and Whole Foods on that same block that all them brothers that you gave rest in peace shout outs to died on. Now it's a Starbucks, a Whole Foods, and a yoga sanctuary right there on that block that some of the brothers you grew up with died on. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? Which once again proved the point that those neighborhoods, if we don't own the real estate there, it's not ours. And it proves once again that that mentality of ghetto and hood and that being our default, that's been given to us by an oppressor. Because I'm going to show you in these scriptures that that was not our default. That's not our natural habitat. Let's go over to 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 15. Listen to how it was at the height of our people's reign. And you tell me, was it any ghettos or hoods whenever our people was in our rightful, natural, organic position. Here's what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 15. It says, And the king made silver and gold at Jerusalem as plenteous as stones, and cedar trees made he as the sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. The scripture here says that in the time of Solomon, that gold and silver was as common as a rock on the ground. Gold and silver was as common as you find in a rock on the ground. Does that sound like a ghetto? Does that sound like a hood? Does that sound like any of these American-made uh, communities that they try to make us believe is the highest we can rise? Does that sound like that to you? No, nah, it don't sound like that to me. So if that's not how our people were living, guess what? That means th those conditions of ghetto and hood that immediately pop up in your mind and that many have been raised in and that some are still living in, guess what? That has been given to us by an oppressor to subconsciously make us believe that that is the extent of our potential, that we're supposed to live in piss-infested squalor and actually make us take pride in that. That mentality has been given to us by an enemy. Because here, I'm reading right here in the scriptures. That's not how our people were living. 
It said gold and silver was as abundant as the rocks on the ground. Does that sound like a piss infested ghetto? Does that sound like a ghetto with uh, three churches on every corner, two chicken spots? Uh, 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 Planned Parenthoods? Does that sound like that? Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25. It says, and Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Stop. Does that sound like a rat-infested, piss-infested ghetto with Planned Parenthood, chicken spots? Does that sound like that? Whole bunch of liquor stores lined up right next to each other, right next to the chicken spot. Does that sound like that? It said that every man had his own land and he dwelt under his own fig tree, meaning that the brothers had their own land that they farmed for food. Does that sound like they were stacked on top of each other in housing projects? Does that sound like they were stacked on top of each other like sardines? Does that sound like they ha had, had that type of issue with the housing authority and, and, and wicked landlords and all that, all the stuff that you see happening in the quote unquote, what they call the ghetto, the hood, all that. Do you see any of that going on here in first Kings chapter four, verse 25, or do you see brothers owning their own land, growing their own food, raising their own livestock, being amongst their families? Let me read it again. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely every man under his vine and under his fig tree. It said they dwelt safely. So did they have to worry about any knuckle drag and Negroes trying to rape their daughters? Did they have to worry about anybody trying to pull a kick dough in their house like you do in many of these quote unquote areas that our enemies have called ghettos, hoods? Do you see any of that going on? So guess what? All these things that we put in our mind that we associate with ghetto, guess what? that's been given by an oppressor. And here's what's beautiful about the Most High. Even though that has been created and given by the oppressor, we as a people still continue to rise even amongst those conditions. Like the brother Pac said, like a rose that grew from a crack in concrete. We still continue to rise even from those conditions. But guess what? Those conditions is not our norm. That's what we need to understand here. The hood, quote unquote, is not the norm for our people. We are royals. We are royalty. We are the sons and daughters of the most high. That's not our norm. What is our norm? Owning our own land, growing our own food, dwelling in safety, mega communities, mega families. That's our norm. So there's a lot of reprogramming and rebooting that we have to do because many of us were raised in those conditions. For those who wasn't raised in those conditions, you got influenced by the culture, by the music, by the movies, by the whole apparatus of what they call, quote unquote, the culture to have that default mentality of hood, of ghetto. Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. It's so to the point where I remember growing up and it was certain people that even if they was not from the city city, they would claim they was from Chicago. They would claim they was from the South side. They would claim they was from the West side, even if they was from the suburbs, because the culture was you ain't really black. If you ain't from those blocks, if you ain't from those wild hunters, you ain't really black. You ain't really all the way real quote unquote, if you're not from these dilapidated conditions. So people that grew up with both parents in the home, good life, they tried to act hood. They tried to act quote unquote ghetto because they wanted to fit in with everybody else because that's what the culture was pushing. The culture was pushing that hood is the norm. Ghetto is the norm. Your best friend's dying at 13, 14 is the norm. People getting locked up and you not seeing them for the rest of your life. Your uncles, your fathers, in some cases, your damn grandfathers 
getting locked up in maximum security prisons, we was taught that was the norm. That That's what was pushed in the music, the movies. And that's what the experience of many of our people, not all of us, but it was so to the point, I saw it with my own eyes. People that was not from the quote unquote hood would try to do their damnedest to act hood to be accepted by the folks from there. But then the folks that was from the hood and from those low conditions, they like, damn, if I could just trade places with y'all and get up out of here, if I could only have that house in the suburbs where I can just chill and watch the Cosby show and play my video games and not have to duck no bullets, if I could only live out there and none of my best friends was dying right in front of my eyes. So the, the Negroes from the burbs wanted to be hood and the Negroes from the hood was trying to get up out of the hood to live the suburban life. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? And a lot of the same folks who back in the day when we was young, they would ridicule those brothers and sisters that grew up in the suburbs or with two parents in the home and had that wholesome lifestyle. They would talk down on them like, man, you ain't real. You, you trying to be white, this and that. A lot of them same Negroes, whenever they grew up, they worked their hardest. So they family, they sons uh, and daughters didn't have to get raised in the ghetto they came from. Only for some more Negroes to then talk to their sons and daughters, calling them lame and you trying to be white because you have a good life. You see how twisted this cycle is? People that's from these communities want to get out and raise their families in a better situation. Then when they get up out of there, raise their families in a better situation, they children that get raised in those good conditions, both parents in the house, now them children want to turn around and be hood <laughs> to, to fit in with the culture. It's crazy. It's crazy, fam. You know what it is? It's pathology. It's what I call the hood ghetto pathology. It's a pathological mindset and it's a wicked cycle. And the only way for us to break that is to understand that the ghetto in the hood is not our norm. That is not our norm. When our people are truly living in our heritage and in our right mind, we, we would look at a, a single parent home like, man, what's going on? You, you, you keeping the commands over there? What's, what, 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 what's happening? What's, what's up with the fatherlessness going on? Or they would step in and take care of the fatherless. That's what the scripture says to do. Take care of the fatherless. But they would look at it as man. Like that that would be looked down upon. But now since we live in a society that that's praised as the norm, many people would look at you like if if both parents is in the home, they'll look at you crazy like dang bro, you got both your parents? Dang sis, you got both your parents? But when our people were on top we looked at it as that's the norm. Like we, we was looking at it like something was wrong if both parents wasn't in the home. Like, man, what, what's going on, man? We, we're going to have to talk to this man who just left y'all. We According to Torah, we're going to have to give him 40 lashes for leaving his family or, 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 or sis, what, what, what's going on? Like we would really look at that and question it. But now the culture and our oppressors have made it seem like the norm, the single parent households, the poverty, the crime, the disease, the hopelessness. You're actually more praised if you live in those conditions than if you're doing well for yourself, taking care of your children, being there for your family and setting forth a, a legacy for your children. The, the Negroes that is leaving their uh, families being a, a terror to their communities in this culture, they're more praised than the brothers that's being the men, taking care of their children, leaving a legacy, providing for their children, protecting their family. You see how wicked this cycle is? So we really have to understand what the true norm is for our people. And if we still find ourselves in some of these dilapidated conditions, we have to look at the example of the Messiah and so many others who rose up out of that. The Messiah rose up out of the ghetto to sit on the right hand of the Father. So if you find yourself in one of those situations, you can get up out. And not only that, 
you can be an example to some of the other brothers and sisters there and you can show them a better way. You ain't going to be able to save all of them. And you even got to be wise with how you deal with some of them because they'll try to kill you like they did Nipsey on some envy type stuff. Mad because you're doing well and they have the same opportunities, but they chose not to use those opportunities the same way that you use those opportunities. So even with helping those that's still in that neighborhood, you have to be wise. And that's why I always say, family, in these days and times, it's about owning land and it's about us being self-sustained again. It really truly is. And it's about us connecting with other brothers and sisters of like mind, the remnant. If you spend too much of your time with the two thirds, you can get destroyed with them. But it's about us connecting with those who truly are hungry for the kingdom. And us making moves to be self-sustained. That's the move in these times. But I don't want to go too far off topic here. I want to read to you something here called the Moynihan Report. The Moynihan Report was written by this Gentile. And this was a man who studied our people. He studied the condition of our people. Much like most of those Gentiles do low key, they study us. And he wrote a report. You can find this everywhere. It's called the Moynihan Report. M-O-Y-N-I-H-A-N. And he goes on to talk about how those conditions of the quote unquote ghetto and hood was created. And even this Gentile went on to say that he was flabbergasted of how our people have still been able to rise, even through these conditions that have been set up. These cities all over the world where our people are at, just like they said about the Messiah, can anything good come from Nazareth? They say, can anything good come from Harlem? Can anything good come from Philly? Can anything good come from Baltimore? Can anything good come from LA? Can anything good come from Chicago? Can anything good come from Gary, Indiana? Can anything good come from Miami, Dade County? Can anything good come from uh, Raleigh, North Carolina? Norfolk, Virginia, uh, Newport News, Bad News, Virginia. Can anything good come from London, UK? All these areas where our people are at, they say, can anything good come from there? And this Gentile who wrote the Moynihan Report, he was sitting there in absolute awe about the resilience of our people. I'm just going to read to you some excerpts from this, and I'm doing this to show you that the ghetto, the hood is a construct that is not the norm for our people. The Most High didn't create us to live in rat-infested, piss-infested ghettos, man. We the children of the creator of the universe, man. In my father's house are many mansions. This is not the will of the father. It's not his will for us to have that mentality for that to be our norm. It's not the will of the father for us to be having the mentalities that we have because you know, with Negroes, man, it's like with some Negroes, you, you're, you're never enough. Either you're not light skinned enough or you're not dark skinned enough. You're not bougie enough or you're not hood enough. With Negroes, <laughs> you, 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 you gotta be you gotta be too hood, you gotta be too bougie, you gotta be too light skinned, you gotta be too dark skinned with many of our people. It's all these different pathologies that's at work. And we as each individual man and woman, we got to find our way to navigate through all this, man, and stay sane and still be able to be productive men and women in the most high kingdom and produce fruit while we on this side of eternity in this world. But it's so much pathology that we have to navigate through. The pathology given to us by the Gentiles and the pathology, the, the twisted mentalities that come from our own people as well. It's like the prophet Ezra said, man, the road to the kingdom is like fire on the right side. And it's like water that you could drown in on the left side. And you walking on this narrow road that only one man could fit on. And you got to duck and dodge all these bullets. You got to duck and dodge all these curses. You got to duck and dodge all this spiritual warfare. 
You got to duck and dodge all these enemies against you. You got to duck and dodge all these wicked uh, pathological mindsets that perpetuate themselves among your people. And you got to walk that narrow road, man. And you can't fall into the fire and you can't fall into the flood. That's what it's like being a Hebrew man or woman in 2019. But guess what? We shall rise. We are rising. The ghetto in the hood can't stop us from rising. The suburbs can't stop us from rising. Like it says in Deuteronomy 28, the blessings of Deuteronomy 28. You shall prosper in the city and in the field. You shall prosper in the house and in the field. So this ain't about hood versus birds. This ain't about uh, house Negro and field Negro. This is about us being obedient to the Most High, worshiping him in spirit and in truth and enduring on this narrow road. And while we're here, being profitable to the Most High and his people and occupying and doing business until he comes. And for us ducking and dodging and moving around and navigating through all these pathological mindsets, pathological neighborhoods, pathological enemies, because guess what? A lot of the same things that we see going on in these ghettos, whenever you start getting into business with some of these Gentiles, let me tell you, some of them is more cutthroat even than the killers in the, in, in the hoods. Yeah. A lot of these white collar, three-piece suit, uh, white boys with their hair combed to the side, you know, with the perfect lineup and the, the, the shoes perfectly polished up and all that. The, the Negroes from the block, they may try to, you know, do something with your wife, take your money, kill you. But these white boys, they do it in a roundabout, slick way. They'll screw you over with paperwork. They'll screw you over with all sorts of bad contracts. They'll uh, besmirch your character, attack your reputation. So nobody will do business with you, do stuff to mess up your credit score. All those type of things. They wage warfare psychologically and through paperwork. Negroes on the block, you know that they're just trying to take your money, take, take your girl, uh, kill you, leave you dead. That, that's the type of stuff Negroes is, is on. But these white boys is on that same stuff to the next level. So guess what we got to be? We got to be street smart, book smart, and spiritually wise and spiritually powerful to navigate through all the pathology. But listen to what this Gentile had to say in the Moynihan Report. In chapter four, he says that the Negro American has survived at all is extraordinary. A lesser people might simply have died out as indeed others have. That the Negro community has not only survived, but in this political generation has entered national affairs as a moderate, humane and constructive national force is the highest testament to the healing powers of the democratic ideal and the creative vitality of the Negro people. You see that? Listen to what it says here. But it may not be supposed that the Negro American community has not paid a fearful price for the incredible mistreatment to which it has been subjected over the past three centuries. So even this Gentile was admitting that the, the oppressor and the Gentiles have created many of these conditions that we now call ghetto, that we now call hood, right? Let, let's keep reading some excerpts here from the Moynihan Report. I'm not going to read it all, but in your spare time, I definitely would suggest you check out this report that this Gentile wrote. Let's look at some more stuff on here. Listen to this next excerpt of what this Gentile had to say about the difference in lifestyle from many of our city dwelling brothers and sisters compared to the rural dwelling brothers and sisters. If you check out a discussion I did called the Roaring Twenties, taking a look at the 100 year cycle of the 1920s to the 2020s, you'll understand I spoke on this in that discussion as well, where I talked about how whenever we as a people live the more rural life of owning our own land, growing our own food, growing our own, dealing with our own cattle, Guess what took place? The family was more intact. Guess what took place? We created more wealth amongst ourselves. Guess what took place? There was no hoods. There was no ghettos that were the default that the oppressor and the enemy has set up. Let me read to you here. I'm going to let the white boy tell it because a lot of folks don't believe it 
when their own brother or sister says it. Let's listen to Moynihan, what he had to say about this very self-same thing. He says, modern means of communication will break down the isolation of the world of the black folk. And as long as the bankrupt system of Southern agriculture exists, Negro families will continue to seek a living in the towns and cities of the country. They will crowd the slum areas of Southern cities or make their way to Northern cities where their family life will become disrupted and their poverty will force them to depend upon charity. So what he was saying is that when our people forsook the rural life where we were self-sustained, that's what led us into crowded ghettos, slums, which eventually these places bred situations that became the wicked cycle we see ourselves in today. You see this? Now let's read. It says, in every index of family pathology, divorce, separation, and desertion, female family head, children in broken homes, and illegitimacy, the contrast between the urban and rural environment for Negro families is unmistakable. Wow. So he was saying that in his research that the our people that were crowded into these ghettos and slums, that the families would often break up. The men would often desert the family, that there would be so much pressure for them to stay in the rat race that it would cause the family to disintegrate, which led to the perpetual cycle of them being trapped in ghettos and slums. You see that? So even the Gentile is saying that when we went away from the self-sufficient lifestyle, that's what took began to take place. Now, let's read here another expert excerpt where he talks about unemployment and poverty. I'm telling you, this Moynihan report goes deep. It says the impact of unemployment on the Negro family and particularly on the Negro male is the least understood of all the developments that have contributed to the present crisis. There is little analysis because there has been almost no inquiry. Unemployment for whites and non-whites alike has on the whole been treated as an economic phenomenon with almost no attention paid for at least a quarter century to social and personal consequences. You see? So once again, he's talking about how the conditions in the ghettos and in the slums created a uh, perpetual pathological system. All right? Now, I'm going to read to you some more excerpts here from a totally different article where uh, yet another heathen starts to talk about how the government and the oppressor created slums and ghettos. Once again, it goes back to my whole premise that I stated at the beginning of the discussion. The ghetto, the hood, as known through the popular culture of today is not our norm, brothers and sisters. That is not our normal environment. That is not the environment that our DNA reacts to. Are you seeing this? The environment that our DNA is used to is gold and silver being as prevalent as stones. The environment that our DNA is used to reacting to is each man having his own land, his own vine tree and fig tree. This is why a lot of brothers and sisters will tell you, even ones that's raised in the like heavy in the in the ghettos and slums packed on top of each other in these in a lot of these cities all over the country. What they will tell you is when they travel to the country, like out in the rural areas, that it's a totally different vibe that comes over your spirit, a totally different type of peace and clarity that you experience, that it's harder for you to experience in some of those neighborhoods. You see? Now you understand why the Messiah, the disciples, the prophets would often go to the mountains to get away and meditate. Whenever you study the brother Muhammad Ali, he reached his highest peaks of greatness whenever he got a cabin in the woods, in the wilderness, and he would go train there. Now you see why the Messiah had to take our people into the wilderness to get our mind right? Now you see why he's going to have to take us into the wilderness again to get our mind right? But guess what? Why wait until it's the most high that has to do it? Why not us take initiative now to acquire land? to be self-sufficient, to grow our own food. Why not us do that now? Why not we break ourselves out of the pathological cycle that they've tried to put us in? The ghettos, the hoods is not our norm, brothers and sisters. We have to reset and reboot our mind. Hallelujah. 
We have to reset and reboot our mind to walk in the power of the Most High as sons of Jacob. I'm going to read some very powerful scriptures about our forefather Jacob here in a moment. But let me just read one more excerpt here from this article. It says, 50 years after the repeal of Jim Crow, many African Americans still live in segregated ghettos in the country's metropolitan areas. Richard Rothstein, a research associate at the Economic Policy Institute, has spent years studying the history of residential segregation in America. So this uh, another Gentile right here, Richard Rothstein, he studied how the Gentiles and the oppressor created the construct of ghettos and hoods. So whenever you see the culture popularizing and glorifying the conditions of the hoods and the ghettos across this country, just know that that's a total psyop. That's a total psyop, family, because number one, those aren't our neighborhoods because we don't own real estate there. It's not your neighborhood if you don't have deeds on properties. If, if we don't own the real estate, it's not ours. So a lot of these communities we've been claiming, a lot of these neighborhoods we've been claiming really never were ours. We just grew up there. A neighborhood and a community is yours when you own the land there and it's in your name. That's when it's your neighborhood. That's when it's your community. That's why what the Gentiles said in the Moynihan report that when our people were owning their own land, we were doing better then because you know why? It was truly ours. It was something we truly possessed. Hallelujah. That's the mentality we have to get back on, family. All praise to the Father. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 30, starting at verse 25. Our forefather Jacob, who is the father of all the 12 tribes of Israel, we need to take a look at his mentality and how he navigated through dealing with an individual with an oppressive uh, mind state, which was Laban. And many of us, find ourselves in similar situations where we may not be under an actual physical Laban, a person, but we find ourselves in a system that is oppressive like Laban was. Because Laban was a liar. Laban was a manipulator. Laban was an opportunist. Many of the enemies that we find ourselves amongst in this society, they have those same characteristics as Laban. You see how Laban lied to Jacob so many times. You see how Laban mistreated Jacob with his wages. And isn't that the same thing the system is doing to us now? People's 401k getting took. People giving 100% into the system and only getting 30% back from the 100% they gave into the system. People working all the way till they 65, 70, only to get their pension snatched with no explanation. Now they got to go do whatever they got to do 70, 75 years old, now got to go back in the workforce because somebody done snatched their pension or their 401k. This system is like Laban was to Jacob. But guess what? Jacob manifested that Hebrew excellent, excellence and he checkmated Laban at his own game. Hallelujah. So this right here, these scriptures is for those who have that same mentality as Jacob or want to have that same mentality as Jacob to where no matter if you find yourself right now while you're listening to this video, if you happen to be in a ghetto or a hood or if you're in the suburbs or if you own your own land deep into the country, all of us need to have the same mentality that Jacob did because he's our forefather and we need to learn from his example. Listen to this. Genesis chapter 30, starting at verse 25, it says, And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said unto Laban, Send me away that I may go into mine own place, into my country. Give me my wives and my children, for whom I have served thee, and let me go. For thou knowest my service, which I have done thee. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry. For I have learned by experience that the Most High have blessed me for thy sake. And he said, Appoint me thy wages, and I will give it. And he said unto him, Thou knowest how I have served thee, and how thy cattle was with me. For it was little which thou hadst before I came, and it is now increased unto a multitude. 
and the Most High have blessed thee since my coming, and now when shall I provide for mine own house also? And he said, What shall I give thee? And Jacob said, Thou shalt not give me anything if thou wilt do this thing for me. I will again feed and keep thy flock. I will pass through all thy flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle and all the brown cattle among the sheep and the spotted and speckled among the goats and of such shall be my hire. So shall my righteousness answer for me in time to come when it shall come for my hire before thy face. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep that shall be counted, that shall be counted stolen with me. And Laban said, Behold, I would it might be according to thy word. And he removed that day the he goats that were ring straight and spotted, and all the she goats that were speckled and spotted, and every one that had some white in it, and all the brown among the sheep, and gave them into the hands of his sons. And he set three days journey betwixt himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and peeled white streaks in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had peeled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle, ring streaks speckled and spotted. I'm going to explain all this what Jacob is doing at the end of these verses. Verse 40. And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring streak and all the brown in the flock of Laban. And he put his own flocks by themselves and put them not unto Laban's cattle. And it came to pass whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Verse 43. And the man increased exceedingly and had much cattle and maid servants and men servants and camels and asses. Hallelujah. So look at that. Jacob, he used the game that Laban was playing and beat him at his own game. So if we transfer that to modern day, Jacob would be a brother that was wise in real estate. Jacob would be a brother that was wise in stock investments. Jacob would be a brother that was wise in creating multiple streams of income for himself and his family and using the system of the Gentiles against them to do it. Hallelujah. He didn't sit there and whine and cry about what Laban was doing. He took action, self-determination, self-discipline, and he lifted him and his family up out of those conditions. And he became greater than Laban and beat Laban at his own game. Hallelujah. All praise to the most high. So you see, we as a people right now need to pray to the most high for that same wisdom and entrepreneurship mindset that Jacob had. Jacob was able to see an opportunity. Jacob was able to transfer his, his resources into assets. Jacob was able to provide for his family and protect his family from an oppressor that was against them. He wasn't no victim. He was a conqueror. You see this? He went from being a wage slave to a man with multiple streams of income. And he beat Laban at his own game. So ever walking around out with a mindset, talking about, man, the, these Gentiles, man, this day system, you know, we, we, we can't work day system because that's theirs. Let me tell you, Jacob did it. Jacob beat them at their own game. Now, when I say beat them at their own game, I'm not saying that we be wicked like them. I'm not saying that we be liars and manipulators and evil and lawbreakers like them. We can beat them at their own game, even with totally following the laws and rules of the Most High. Because guess what David said? David said, through the Most High's laws, he makes me wiser than my enemies. The heathens and them, they got the 48 laws of power. We got 613 laws of power in the Torah that makes us wiser than our enemies. Hallelujah. The scripture also tells us it is the most high our Elohim that gives us power to make wealth, just like Jacob did. And he checkmated Laban through wisdom, 
through sweat equity, through strategic intuition, through wealth building strategies. He was able to outsmart his enemy and set up his family for generations upon generations upon generations. Hallelujah. He was able to raise a future king, Joseph. He was able to raise another future king, Judah. He was able to raise a future priest. He was able to raise 12 young boys who now are seated on thrones around the, the throne of the Most High. He was able to raise 12 young boys whose names will be written on the gate of heaven because of his mindset of being a winner, uh, his resourcefulness, his mindset to take his situation and to put himself in a better situation, to position himself strategically. Family, especially you men, it's our job to do the same thing Jacob did. Yeah, we see what is against us. We see that this oppressor is like Laban. We see he's trying to put us into the hoods and the ghettos and make us have a hood and ghetto mentality. But we know who we truly are and we got to activate that DNA. We got to be indwelled with the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh. And we have to get access to the resourcefulness of the spirit of the most high to be wiser than our enemies that are amongst us. Even though they set all these traps and that's another name that they have for the ghetto, the hood, the trap. But guess what? The most high makes us quick footed like a deer on the mountains so that we can step on our high places so that our foot would not be snared so that our foot would not stumble. Hallelujah. All these snares and traps that they've set Guess what? We are wiser than our enemies through the Holy Spirit of the Most High. All praise. So no ghetto can stop us. No hood can stop us. Can anything good come out of Chicago? You damn right it can. Can anything good come out of Detroit? You damn right it can. Can anything good come out of Harlem? You damn right it can. Can anything good kind of come out of Miami-Dade County? You damn right it can. Guess who's going to come out of those areas? Us, the sons and daughters of Jacob, the people of the Most High. And we will come out on top like Jacob came out on top of Laban. All praise to the Most High. I pray that you got something out of this discussion. Before I go, I want to remind brothers and sisters of some projects of the ministry. We have the 613 Laws of Torah audiobook that we have done. That is an audio book that contains all 613 laws of Torah narrated by myself. And in that audio book, we narrate it from the King James Version of Scripture. And we don't use any of the pagan names like God or Lord. And there's no other extra commentary. It's just straight 613 laws of Torah. We put together that project because the Scripture says that faith comes by hearing. And the scripture also commands us in Joshua chapter one, verse six to eight, that we are commanded to meditate on the laws and commands day and night. And since we live in a fast paced society, we put the laws and commands in audio book form so the brothers and sisters can put on their headphones, put on their beats and listen to the laws and commands Download it to your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your desktop. You can listen to the laws and commands while you're driving in your car while you're at work, while you're working out in the gym. You can listen to the laws and commands while you're going to sleep at night. You can listen to the laws and commands while you're in the kitchen cooking. You can listen to the laws and commands at all times. And whenever you listen to it with repetition over and over again, it causes you to internalize the information. The laws become written on your heart, and that makes you better able to obey what the Most High says. So we put together that audio book, The 613 Laws of Torah, narrated by myself. I'll put the link in the description box underneath this video on how you can invest in that project. That project has affected a lot of people all over the world. All praise to the most high and through the support of you, the people. That audio book hit number one on Amazon in the genre of Old Testament meditations and Hebrew Bible. So we hit number one, even above all those false Jews and their little books. We hit number one above all those other nasty uh, audio books people do with the sinful stuff. We hit it doing the laws and commands and that's all glory to the father. So once again, 
If you're interested in investing in that project and downloading that audio book, check out the link in the description box underneath the video. That's the 613 Laws of Torah narrated by myself, Brother L. Also, another project we have is the Words of the Messiah audio book. That is a four hour long audio book. The Laws of Torah audio book is five hours. The Words of the Messiah audio book is four hours. That contains all of the words the Messiah spoke recorded in scripture from Matthew to John, all his wise sayings, his parables. We put it in an audio book so that you can listen to the words of the Messiah. The Messiah is the Torah and the word in the flesh. So we put together an audio book to listen to his words so that we can follow in his footsteps and his example. He never broke his father's law. So by meditating on his words, we learn more how to worship the most high in spirit and in truth. That same Messiah that they said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? The king of the universe rose up out of the slums of Nazareth. Hallelujah. And the neighborhood and the city he's creating for us ain't going to have no hoods or no ghettos. All right. Hallelujah. Because he knows that's not what we're created for. That's not our norm. So let's rise, Israel. So check out that link in the description box for the words of the Messiah audio book. Another audio book we've done is the words of the father audio book. The scripture says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the father. So we literally put together an audio book with only the words of the father himself out of his own mouth or through the inspiration of the prophets, all the way from Genesis, where he said, let there be light all the way to the New Testament, where he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's a 14 hour long audio book narrated by myself with only the words of the father. I will also put the link in the description box underneath this video on how you can invest in that project. Another great thing we have going with here, myself and the ministry is the Hebrews for excellence and Exodus campaign. The scripture says that the truth must be spread to all four corners of the earth. So what we're doing with the Hebrews for excellence and Exodus campaign is we are traveling from city to city all over the United States and all over the world. In those cities, we will be doing baptisms. We will be preaching and teaching in the streets. We will be going to the orphanages, the homeless shelters, the prisons, the hospitals, the nursing homes to minister to our people, to lay hands on the sick, to cast out demons, to do all those works that the Messiah and the disciples did and that they tell us to do. We're going to be traveling all over doing that. And we'll also have meetings in these cities where we discuss homeschooling, launching home fellowships, and launching home businesses. These are things that will help us as a people to be self-sufficient. So with all those things, also, we're going to be acquiring land. I've talked about this before here in January of 2020. We are acquiring land here in Georgia and also in Arkansas. And these will be for Torah-based Hebrew communities. We will, we will grow our own food, where we will have our own cattle, where we will truly be self-sustained and be set apart. Hallelujah. I'm looking very much forward to acquiring those lands to build those communities. Because remember, it's all about us having true community. It's all about us being self-sustained. Every man being under his own fig tree and his own vine tree, as the scripture says, living in peace living in safety as much as we can in these last and wicked times. So for those who are interested in traveling with us as we go from city to city, check out my email, which is in the description box underneath this video. Link up with me. Get in touch with me. Let's see what we can do if you're really serious about doing some true ministry work. For brothers and sisters who want to support monetarily with donations, I'll also put my link in the description box on how you can donate to the Hebrews for Excellence and Exodus campaign fund. Whatever the help that you can give, we appreciate. If you can't give no help at all, we appreciate that too. We just thank you for tuning in to the videos. Most High Will will be back tomorrow with another scripture discussion as we go forward with doing the work of the Most High. Let's rise, my people. Let's keep enduring to the end with victory, success, and destiny. Shalom. All right. All right. All right. All right, y'all. <laughs> I mean, many of us could relate to what he was saying. I mean, look, I grew up in the hood and I know I told y'all this several times. I grew up in Southwest Philadelphia. 
<laughs> okay? So I know what he's talking about, but you know, the part I did not experience is the gentrification because by the time that happened, we had already, we had long left and moved into the suburbs. So I did not get to experience that part of it. But y'all, thank you for being here. Please enjoy the rest of your Shabbat and enjoy the Passover as well. And we'll come together and do this again next week. Shalom, family.